So this morning, we had uh, an interesting session. We covered a number of items, didn't we? So just a recap. What were some of the items that we covered? Well, we looked at the environment. We talked about how the environment can affect the, the performance of the company. So we looked at various elements in the environment. We also looked at the models that we use in strategic planning and how they affect the, the performance measurement and management process. Within our syllabus also, there's the concept of uh, business structures. Now a business structure, business structure is very important because that's uh, the vehicle that we use. Business structure is a vehicle that we use to achieve our business objectives. So to achieve our business objectives, we need a business structure in place. And I'm very sure that most of you, during, during your waking lives, you have seen organizations introduce new structures. I'm sure a number of you have actually sometimes benefited from the introduction of the new structure with either a promotion or enhanced job description. I'm sure a number of us have benefited. So for an organization to achieve its objectives efficiently and effectively, there's need to review from time to time, we review the structure to check if it's still efficient in the delivery of organization objectives. And if it's not, what do we do? You find that the organization reviews the structure and changes accordingly. From our examination point of view, when it comes to business structures, there are four items that we can eye in the exam. Number one, the concept of business process re-engineering. This is a model which is very important when it comes to reviewing or assessing the organization structure. Number two, you've got the concept of the value chain. The value chain is a, a powerful business integration model. It helps an organization to identify where value is created in the organization and also to see how you can uh, maximize value creation. For a long time, I remember teaching and teaching this model, the McKinsey model. McKinsey 7S model. We taught it for years and you never saw a question. But one of the recent papers carried a question on the McKinsey model. Again, a business integration model. At this point also, I find it appropriate to bring in something that is at the end of our syllabus. And this is called complex business structures complex business structures. The concept of concept complex business structures is an important concept because of the developments taking place. Because of developments that take place in the, on the subject of business structures, 
the traditional structures what he, that we saw and worked with for many years are giving way to new types of structures. The traditional structures are giving way to new types of structures. And so our examiners want us to be able to talk about these new structures. But also maybe more importantly, the challenges. What are the challenges with these new structures? And how do we manage these challenges? What are the challenges and how do we manage the challenges associated with what you can call new structures? Specifically here, cut and pasted from your syllabus, it says, uh, discuss the impact. So you see again, they want us to talk about the impact on performance management of the use of business models, such as the strategic alliances, a joint venture, and complex supply chain structures. How do these impact on the performance management? You are our experts on this. You must be able to tell us what's the implication of these new types of models the way we manage performance for organizations. These are the items that you now want to zero in on. So again, we'll break down these items and run through them. So let us uh, get started. Let's look at some of uh, these business integration models. So we start with BPR, Business Process Reengineering. Business process reengineering. And I like the definition of BPR. I like the definition of BPR. Business process reengineering. What I like are the big words. What I like are the big words in this definition. What I like in this definition are the big words. Look at the big words that are used in this definition. Eh? Yeah. The fundamental, quite a big word. Eh? Quite a big word there being used. It says uh, the fundamental. Rethinking. So what does this mean, fundamental rethinking? We are saying we are going to the root. Fundamental simply means we're going to the root. We don't just do a surface evaluation, no. Deep thinking. Deep thinking. And the, once we fundamentally rethink then and radical redesign of business processes, now, radical means that we are talking about a complete change here. We are talking about the transformation. Yeah? This carries the thought of uh, the transformation. So we are talking about transformation here of business processes. But why do you have to rethink and radically redesign processes? Why should we rethink and redesign our processes? I'm sure you now know the answer. The answer is about performance. It's about performance improvement. 
That is the answer. about performance improvement. To achieve dramatic improvements in critical contemporary measures of performance, what are the critical contemporary performance measures or areas or what you can call the critical success factors? Well, these are critical contemporary measures include cost, quality, service, and speed. Now remember that the area one we spoke about even differentiation. Yeah? It's on these areas that you can differentiate yourselves. So why we need to redesign the processes is because we want to cut on the cost, to manage the cost. But one high quality also improve the service and also quick delivery of the service. So this is the reason why we carry out a business process engineering exercise. So what do you expect after this exercise has taken place? What would we expect in the organization? Let us see what we expect, the end result of this process. Processes should be designed to achieve a desired customer-focused outcome. Our focus should be on the outcome rather than on tasks. What does the customer want? Can you deliver it? One of the things that I normally think about is the process which for many, many years was in the, in the banks. It's one, a process which was used for many, many years in the bank. What was that process? Displacing money to customers via the counter. For many, many years, what would happen is that you and me, we go to our banks, we line up to get notes. And there was the, the process, there were tasks involved, making sure the money is available, it comes there and the person is there. But what was the impact of it? That process was radically redesigned and automated. The focus was what we want is people to get money. So what happens? That process was redesigned, restructured. And now all of us, when are looking for money, where do we go? We go to the ATM. What people are looking for is not entering in the banking hall, no. What the customer is looking for is to get their cash and to move on. And this has even further gone to another level now, where we can transact on our own, on the phones. We can transact our, on our own via the internet. So all these developments taking place. All these development, if you think about them, they're a product of BPR exercises the use of ATMs, the use of phones, the use of internet banking. Think about all these. These are products of BPR where people get to the root of the process and try to think about changing the process so that there's better performance in what? In cost. You can see how the use of phones and the internet has cut some of the costs, the quality an enhanced service, but also can you quickly get what we're looking for. So the processes that are being redesigned, what we think is, what does the customer want from them? It's a know who use output from a process should perform the process. 
And that's, that's what is happening now. You and me are displacing our own money and getting our own money. Mm -hmm. We don't have to lie on somebody else. There is no differentiation between information gathering and processing because of real-time processing. Real-time processing. Geographically displaced resources should be treated as if they were centralized. We don't even realize that the resources are geographically displaced, isn't it? Here we are, we are attending this lecture from far away places. All of us are geographically displaced. But when you look at the list of participants, you can't tell. Parallel activities should be linked, not integrated. Otherwise, we, make, we can start to creating queues. We can start creating unnecessary queues. So what we must do is just link them up, not to integrate them, become one. In this sort of all setup after VPR, there's no distinction between managers and workers. Information should be captured once. That's what happens today. We don't want duplication in terms of information captured. Okay, so that is the VPR there. A model which is used to describe redesign of business processes. And the, there was one examiner, one exam sitting where we had uh, this sort of a question. And of course, BPL has come several times. BPL has come several times, but it let us understand what BPR looks like. There's one particular question paper, which he, the scenario there describes the BPR exercise very well. It describes the BPR exercise very, very well. So what I will do now, I'm going to share the question paper. The question paper that we'll share is June 2016. I want you to quickly read through the scenario to get an understanding of how a BPR exercise looks like and the impact of BPR on an organization and how it can affect the operational performance of an organization. So I will now be sharing the question paper on the forum and, quick, and quickly read through. Five, five, six minutes should be enough so that we have an idea of uh, how a BPR exercise would look like. So let me share now the question paper. Okay, so we have a, um, a business process for engineering here. And with a lot of changes that are happening. Okay. So what changes are we seeing that will happen here? We notice that uh, uh, operations were functional based, isn't it? Earlier on our operations were functional based. But following BPR now what happens? We are switching to teams. Yeah, we are switching to teams. What are some of the implications? Well, uh, the team has to start and finish, the, finish everything now. So we are saying that the, at the moment, there's the employees are not much skilled. Each employee chose only to use and work with one type of machine, but in a team now, one people can start and they finish everything. Yes. The issue of uh, somebody just working on one type of machine won't be there anymore in terms of operations. So we end up with employees that are mouth skilled now. 
So if somebody can start and finish a product alone, it means that the job will become richer. We expect more motivation. But also we may have to retrain people. And normally there's a cost implication to that, isn't it? There's a cost implication to that. People concentrate on results rather than activities. That is very true. What of the quality? There's a change in terms of quality, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Individual teams were now responsible for quality issues, isn't it? And the, now employees would be encouraged to have a say on the matter of quality. Within the team, they should be able to deal with all the quality issues. There's no managers and supervisors now, all people at the same level. In terms of tracking information, the radio frequency identification tags will now be used. So instead of somebody sitting down to do the documentation, to write down everything, that will not arise anymore. Information will be captured once and for all. So that's what we expect. So that is a change that we expect. So that's the exchange that we expect. So this uh, scenario helps us to consider, helps us to consider the subject of business process engineering. That's what we see. So this is a very good scenario. And the company in question also is equally very, very good. Let us uh, continue with our assessment. There's value chain and McKinsey 7S model. Value chain and McKinsey 7S model. So let us uh, look at these now. Let's look at this. McKinsey and 7S model. Let's start with the, the McKinsey. These are what we call, this is an example of what we call business integration. We want to improve performance. We want to improve performance. So how can we improve performance? Well, we have what we call business integration models. And one of the models is 7S model. For good performance for an organization to perform more and achieve its objectives, there's a need for an integration of the various components of the organization. All aspects of a business must be aligned to secure the most efficient use of the organization's resources to achieve its objectives effectively and to create value. So when you take an organization, you can split it into two, two main areas. What are these? The hard and the soft the hard and the soft. So this model says that every organization has got these seven and to deliver the best result, this must be, this must be aligned. We need an alignment of all these. Let's talk about them now. 
These are components of an organization and there are seven of them. So we've got a structure like the business structure that you've been talking about. Okay. Secondly, in addition to the structure, we have systems, different systems in place in the organization. In addition to that, we have a strategy. These are what we can call hard or visible. Then we can have, we have what we call soft components, the management style, the people. And these people have got skills. And what is connecting all these is what you call shared values or the culture. So the culture is what binds all these together. The seven A's need to be aligned for an organization to be effective. You cannot have a, a strategy without staff, without skills, without effective management. So the seven A's need to be aligned for an organization to be effective. Organizations can use the model to help assess whether or not this is the case. For an organization, we can sit down and can say, do we have a proper structure in place through which all people can be organized to achieve the objectives? Do we have uh, the right people for the strategy that we're about to implement? We may have the people, but they have the skills. Do we have an effective management team? So I call this model, if all these are in place, if there's a gap, then we move in to close the gap. If all these are in place, they need to improve. If the elements are not properly aligned, an organization also needs to assess which of the S needs to change and how they need to change in order to improve performance. So we may need to invest. We may need to review the organization structure. So that is the concept here. And this is an example of a business integration model. And the concept of integration is about all aspects of the business must be aligned to secure the most efficient use of the organization's resources and to achieve its objectives effectively and to create value. Let's go to another model, the value chain, the value chain. Yes, traditionally we think of organizations in terms of the structures, the traditional structures. We think about the organizations and organization in terms of a traditional structure. But that may not be the best because what the customers pay us for, they pay us for value creation. Eh? Customers pay us for value creation. For example, why do, why do we go to restaurants? 
why don't we eat the same food from our homes? Why do we go to KFC? Why do we go to Hungry Lion and pay more? In your own home, you can prepare a chicken and have it. But you're going to restaurant, a restaurant where you pay more. Why? That's what this model shows us here. Let's go through it. The sequence of business activities by which you value from the customer's perspective is added to an organization's product or services. So organization products or services. A collection of the value that has been created. So as customers, what do we pay for? We pay for value creation. Therefore, as an organization, we need to find out how is value created. And this model says that value is created by first of all, stationing the primary activities. So these activities cover these items and inbound logistics. So what is inbound logistics? Before operations can take place, before we can convert the raw chicken into a product that will be sold, the must first of all inputs. So this is the function which is responsible for bringing all the inputs together. So here we are concerned with the inputs. All the inputs must be in place on time in the right quantities and even quality so that now we can convert them into outputs. So this is now the output. And this output, it must be packaged, must be properly stored, must be ready for collection. It should be delivered to the customers. That's the outbound logistics. These products, we need to market them. Eh? The marketing function is very critical. We need to find a way of making our customers aware of the products that we have. And finally, support, customer support. Customer support. So we need to make sure that we make a follow up with our customers and we support them. This is a series of value creation. These primary activities on their own cannot run. They need to be supported by the people in procurement who are going to procure resources for us. We need uh, experts in technology. We need HR to ensure that uh, they bring together all manpower. We need guys in planning, in accounting to support all this. So primary activities and sup support activities Primary activities and support activities. When we put them together, what happens? We create value. We create value. And it's because of the value I've created that you can now have a margin. So that margin, that additional amount that you are prepared to pay, over and above the amount that we could have spent ourselves by preparing that chicken at your home, this additional amount represents value creation. This represents value creation. 
So that's the value creation. Do you want to create value? The answer is yes. We use the model to evaluate our current situation. Now, <clears throat> for this course, like we've been saying all along, we come back to the concept of performance. So then, what's the implications for performance management? Value chain helps to identify the key areas which create value for customers. Or what we call the critical success factors. And these are the items that we must invest in. These are the items that you must invest in. So we need to invest in critical success factors because that's what the customers will pay for. Organization needs to measure. Now we are, we are back to KPIs. So value for money helps us to identify critical success factors. Organization needs to measure its performance in those areas. So correct KPIs. Should be linked to the critical success factors that we've identified here. In order to achieve a competitive advantage, an organization needs to perform key activities more cheaply or better than its competitors. Meaning that you need to benchmark and compare with others. What we are saying then here is that if you're going to be better than others, you must review all these. To be successful, an organization needs to ensure that the characteristics of all activities are consistent. So consistency is needed. If there's no consistency, then you have a problem, isn't it? Back to competitive advantage that we discussed earlier on, what are strategies? A firm gains competitive advantage by either performing strategically important activities more cheaply, which is cost leadership, or better, which is differentiation. So we can either apply cost leadership on these activities. So that we are better than our competitors. Or if it's not, we can apply differentiation where we do these things differently and much smarter than our competitors. So that's the implication of the value chain. It, help, it helps us in identifying critical success factors, KPIs, and also it helps us to see where we can beat our competitors using course leadership or differentiation. So these are the two business integration models <clears throat> that we have. Mm -hmm. What are those? The value chain and the McKinsey model. Okay, that now takes us to another aspect, complex business structures. Complex business structures. Let's look at the concept of complex business structures. 
What are these structures? Why do we call them complex? So let's uh, <clears throat> discuss the concept of complex business structures. And more importantly, what is the challenge in terms of uh, performance management? What is the challenge when you look at these type of organizations? What challenge do we have? And what should we do about um, <laughs> these structures. Here we are. So we've got what we call non-traditional structures here. Now let's discuss them. Traditional organizations, how do they look like? And why are these called complex? So in a traditional organization, normally we expect a single organization. All people employed in that organization, isn't it? So we've got a single organization and everybody is employed within there. You all have the same mission statement. You all have the same mission statement. You are all operating under the same code of conduct. And also in terms of uh, physical location, in a traditional organization, at a particular point in time, we all be physical in one place. And we have a structure, a proper structure, reporting structure, in terms of who reports to who. We have a clear reporting structure. And all of you are in one place. The manager can see all the people, they are all under him. So the person who's the manager is able to see, can even walk around and talk to these people, can motivate them. And let's look at the differences with the, some of these structures. Joint venture. Two organizations are coming together to run a project for different reasons. And each uh, partner, joint venture partner, brings something to the venture so that this venture is run, this product project is run successfully. So when it comes to performance management and we have a joint venture in front of us, what are the issues? The partners may have different goals. If we are from the same organization, we'd have the same goal or same set of goals. But we have a situation where the partners may have different goals. So when it comes to measuring and managing performance, what are you going to focus on? We've got the issue of ensuring that there's coordination, proper coordination. And like people coming from the same organization where the reporting lines may naturally connect you, that's not the case here. And the issue of control may not be easy. Now we have got something bigger, sharing information.
it may not be easy to share information, especially that which relates to intellectual property. You cannot manage to expose all type of information. So when it comes to managing performance, managing performance involves having performance reports, which show all relevant aspects. But the, the level of sharing of information may not be the same here. That will affect the performance management information. You don't belong to the same organization. There's the issue of trust. You need to establish trust. And in case there's no trust, that will affect performance management in terms of what you disclose. That is one aspect of our discussion. Another aspect is strategic alliance. We may have uh, to cooperate with somebody in delivering a task. We want to join hands under strategic alliance. Success depends on communication and collaboration rather than formal goals. So in this type of loose arrangements, we just have an alliance, which is not permanent. Have some time after the, the activity has been done, you all disappear. And the critical issues that may bring a challenge is the issue of communication and collaboration, they are critical, rather than goals and objectives. If you, if you belong to the same organizations, goals and objectives will support you. We have got a number of stakeholder organizations that contribute to success. And these stakeholder organizations come from different backgrounds, in terms of the size, in terms of the objectives, so at the end of the day, how do you manage your performance? Who's going to get credit for success? What KPIs are you going to use? Common KPIs. What are the, what are the critical success factors? And how do you cooperate? Another item which our examiner wants us to talk about in complex business structures. Another item is multinationals. A multinational outfit is quite complex, isn't it? A multinational outfit is a fairly complex outfit. An organization which has got operations around the world an organization with operations around the world. So our examiner wants us to point out some of the performance management issues. Performance measurement issues from comparing subsidiaries in different countries. So these are in different countries. All oh, these are in different countries. So how do we compare the performance of these units? How do you come up with the realistic standards? Standards are to reflect local conditions. These standards must reflect your conditions. Now, you know, if you have a problem with standards and performance management becomes a challenge because 
performance management, we have said, is it's all about meeting objectives. Or meeting your targets. That's what it's all about. There's also issue of controllable. Controllable and uncontrollable items. Controllable and uncontrollable items. You need to be very clear about it. Which cash flows are controllable and which ones are uncontrollable? Which item should we be held responsible for? What of currency conversion? The impact of currency exchange rate. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the reported results may be affected by what? By the exchange rates, which are really uncontrollable. I have no control on it. The exchange rate. Do I have control by the exchange rate? No. Those are uncontrollable. So how do I deal with those? Procedures used to obtain performance information. The performance reports, the frequency of the reports, the format of the reports, we need to agree all that so that we can consolidate the head office. So all these must be taken into account. All these must be taken into account. What of a virtual organization? How does it look like? Now, this one is an interesting organization. A traditional organization has got physical presence. It's got a physical location. You are going to find people who report at the, a physical location every day, isn't it? Huh? Like uh, most of us before COVID, there was a place we wanted to report to every day. And like a virtual organization, mm -hmm. these are organizations really, which are not physical per se, made up of people in different geographical locations. And the technology is what connects them. These people are connected by technology. So technology is what connects these people. These are people working together and some they have never physically met. But using technology, they are able to deliver. And COVID has just taught us that that's very, very possible actually. There's a lot of uh, people now who are working online, who found a job online, and they just work online. And they're in different parts of the world. I know some young men locally here in Osaka, they're working with four firms that are in Australia, the firms that are in the USA. Hmm? All they do is log on, they find their work, they do their work and deliver it. So what is the challenge? Controlling and monitoring performance of remote workers. These people who are remote, remote workers. How do we control and monitor these people? Timeliness, quantity, and the quality of goods or services. Normally what we do is we emphasize on service level agreements. Tight service level agreements. 
which spell out exactly what is expected and when it is expected. And even the formats, and even the formats. Uh, let's uh, take some example. For instance, there's a young man around who works for a firm in Australia. So I ask him that, how are you monitored? How are you monitored? Because you are here, Mm -hmm. And people are, uh, your boss is far away. Do you have any on the forum who have an experience of being a remote worker? On this call, do you have any who have an experience of being a remote worker? Do you have any who have an experience of being a or working for a virtual organization on this call. Yes, let's see who this one is. Yes, okay, please. Can you unmute yourself and tell us how is your performance monitored? Let's start with Chenge. Chenge, how is your performance monitored as a remote worker? Um, hello. It was monitored based on work um, assigned. So obviously certain tasks should take a certain amount of time. So all our information was on shared format. So we would just ensure that uh, within a week, certain tasks have been performed and you've submitted reports. So it's deadlines and certain tasks performed within a certain uh, timeline. Well done. Thank you for that input. We have another one here, Visayo Aditayo. Tell us something with your experience of uh, being a remote worker. How was your work monitored? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Hello? Okay, okay so you. Go ahead. I'm a trader. I'm a pop trader. Okay, I'm a pop trader, so I trade for a company. Uh, I trade equities, stock market. So for me, I have my KPI, so uh, we work with budget, so it's big. So I know the amount I have to make every year based on my budget. Then also, I have the head of pop trading that I report to. So we have a meeting every week on Monday, so that way, uh, it can track if uh, business we do NPR because I'm a middle level manager. So you also have to go and report what you have done for the month. Well done. Ah, this is a nice way of learning. You see, we're now getting a first hand experience of people who are doing it. That's very good. Guys, keep it up. Thank you very much for your input onto the call. Yes, and this young man I was talking about, also him, the way he was being monitored was uh, logging in. As soon as he logged in, somebody in Australia was checking that, yeah, he's logged in, he's on. And they'll be seeing what he's doing. It was IT support. One of the times when he didn't have a project, what was happening? They expected him still to be online, to be doing, personal development work. They'll still be monitoring the type of research he was doing mm -hmm. to ensure that he, when there was no client that he was supporting per se, he was busy still mm -hmm, acquiring skills that are relevant to his work. And the company was willing to pay for that as long as, as, long as he was acquiring skills that would later help, like we saw in the McKinsey 7S model there, they will still pay for that. And there were implications, if they check, you're not doing anything, you have not logged on, and according to the contract, they'll start deducting this and that. These are the type of organizations 
predominantly that we are going to have in the future, isn't it? Yeah. It's not easy to motivate this type of employees. Eh? We've just heard from our friend there that it's a meeting. Every Monday you have a meeting where you agree your targets and objectives and all that. Mm. In a physical setup, what happens? Even when they don't feel like working, if you see your boss moving around and he comes to you, he greets you, what happens? You find from nowhere, you get some energy, you get motivated to start work. But when you're alone online, wow, we need to be yourself start. Eh? Yeah. Somebody has asked, what's the difference between a joint venture and a strategic alliance? A joint, a joint venture is much more, is a lot more permanent. This one is a fair and loose arrangement. Okay. This one is fair and loose arrangement. Uh, if I win a contract, I win a big job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't have uh, equipment. I can ask you to come and provide me with some equipment. We can enter into an arrangement of some kind. Whilst, as you know, the joint ventures can run even for, like here back at home, we've got uh, our rail line. Our rail line is uh, a joint venture between two countries and it's been running for quite some years and like such these alliances that uh, come and go and we see them everywhere even in political arenas isn't it we see people coming up with an alliance for the purpose of an election what happens after that is dismantled so that's the difference The last arrangement here that we can talk about is a supply chain, a very interesting arrangement, eh? a supply, supply chain management or supply chain network. This is very interesting. <clears throat> Again, we are saying that, you know, as opposed to working alone, today, if you notice, we don't work alone we need to collaborate with other organizations to create value. The traditional approach was anyone outside your organization is not part of you, was not part of you. That's the understanding. Hear this expression. We are talking about a move away, a move from what? the traditional arm's length supplier purchase relationship to develop stronger relationship between organizations in the supply chain. People outside the organizations look at them as adversaries. That's how we looked at them. And the idea was, how can I make the biggest profit? Now today we're saying we're moving away from this. Arms length supplier purchase relationship to a situation where we have got a stronger relationship between organizations in the supply chain. So the supply chain management looks at the, the supply chain as a whole. And where is that organizations in the supply chain collaborate to produce value for the end customer? Look at in the motor assembly plants. Hmm? How many players are there? A lot of players. A lot of suppliers. Some just do engines. Others do tires, others do glass, electronics. The modern approach of thinking is that all those must consider themselves to be part of the same supply chain. And if uh, as a supply chain we work well, if as a supply chain we work well, If we are more efficient and reduce inefficiencies and duplications, when a customer finally pays for the vehicle, overall, we can have a bigger profit. 
if the supply chain is efficient, if we don't look at ourselves as an individual organization, but part of a network and work together, hmm, we collaborate to produce value for the end customer. If we collaborate, what will happen? Out of the money that will finally be paid, all of us will be able to make a good margin. Close relationship between producers and customers, serious collaborations. That's a modern way of working. And what supports all this? Technology. Electronic data interchange, the use of ERPs where suppliers can log into our system. All this enables us to respond rapidly with the changing customer needs. So the whole chain can respond very quickly. So uh, the, the concept of uh, complex structures is about let's move from a traditional structure. where you just have a single organization located in a particular place with a clear organization structure, objectives and all that. Nowadays, we're working with other organizations. In other words, we'll collaborate. It may be a joint venture, supply chain management or network, strategic alliance, we we'll collaborate. Also, this is uh, the concept people or complex supply chains huh? or complex organization structures. But is the concept. And the examiner want us to highlight some of the performance management issues in this type of structures. Okay, so we have our Comfort break now. Let's see. Yeah, so we have our comfort break now for 15 minutes before we can come for the last uh, lap. So please, I'll leave this on. Take a break for 15 minutes. And after that, we are back. So at 15.20, we are back, people, to conclude our work. <laughs> 